Chapter 30, verses 30 and 31 of the Holy Quran say, Say to the believing men that they lower their gaze and restrain their sexual passions. That is pure for them, surely Allah is aware of what they do. And say to the believing women that they lower their gaze and restrain their sexual passions and do not display their adornment except what appears thereof and let them wear their head coverings over their bosoms. I've noticed recently that the news has once again been lit up on the issue of women in Islam and whether Islam oppresses the female gender or not. So I wanted to take a look, I wanted to take a broad look at the various issues that some people bring up again and again as reasons that Islam is an oppressor of women. Probably the most often mentioned and criticised thing is the full veil. Now, it is such a big issue for some Western countries that they have introduced laws that ban women from wearing the full veil. Men have decided that it's appropriate for them to decide what women can and cannot wear. That certainly, doesn't see, that certainly does seem like a strange way of showing freedom to women. So, do women in Islam have to completely cover themselves from head to toe in a veil? I read out verses 30 and 31 from chapter 24 of the Holy Quran, and the first thing to notice is that it instructs men what to do. We are told to behave modestly by lowering our gaze, and then it gives the same instruction to women. Now, men and women are both meant to cover their heads, but women are told that they must also cover their bosoms for modesty. And this is the only place in the Holy Quran that I know of that talks about any sort of veil. The full body coverings that the TV and news media like to show again and again is not mentioned in the Holy Quran at all. But verse 31 also says, do not display your adornment except what appears thereof. <clears throat> so this makes it clear that you dress modestly to the extent that it's culturally normal where you live. So that would mean that there is no rule for all women to wear a full veil. It means that you dress appropriately to the culture in which you live. As an example, what might be thought of as modest in Britain might not be seen that way in India. So if you lived in India but dressed with the British mentality of modesty, then you're not following this instruction of the Holy Quran. So someone who lives in England and wears a full body covering is in fact not following the guidance given by Allah on how to behave modestly as it's not appropriate to the culture in which they're living. If we look at some examples from early Islam, we find that women played a very active role in the community. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, first wife, was a successful business person. And she had in fact employed the Holy Prophet to work for her. During times of war, women tended to the injured, collected armaments like swords, arrows and shields from the battlefield and brought water for the soldiers. Women worked in the orchards and the fields side by side with men. I would think that it would have been very difficult for them to do many of these things if they had been wearing a full body covering. The only exceptions <clears throat> to what I've just mentioned are the wives of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, who for their own safety were told to observe seclusion and a full covering. And this came partially as a result of the time Hazrat Aisha got lost in the desert and false and damaging rumours were spread about her. But even then, the full covering didn't exclude them from public life. Hazrat Aisha, for example, still ran her own seminary and many learned men and women attended to learn from her details about the Holy Prophet's life. So 
On the basis of what I've read and understand, women are not obliged or ordered to wear a full body covering at all. Women, like men, are under instruction to act modestly and dress modestly. The Islamic view is that it is demeaning for a woman to display herself like a product or a piece of meat in the shop window. A woman is to be recognised for her ability, her knowledge and her achievements and not just her physical appearance. The next thing I often hear is that men in Islam are superior to women and women must obey their men without question. Unconditional obedience to men. Well, that's an easy accusation to answer. The answer is no. And that is because no person can command unconditional obedience from anybody, whether it's a man or a woman. Only the divine being, Allah, can command unconditional obedience from mankind. The verse in the Holy Quran which has sparked the above accusations is chapter 4, verse 34. And it says, Men are the maintainers of women, with what Allah has made some of them to excel others, and with that they spend out of their wealth. So the good women are obedient, guarding the unseen as Allah has guarded. The problem with understanding verses like these is that many people put a modern day thinking and understanding to them without putting it into the context of the time it was revealed or understanding how Islam treats a family structure. When it says men are the maintainers of women, this is an instruction to men that we are obliged to make sure that whatever else we do, that we make sure our wives are looked after. The burden of paying the mortgage or rent and the bills, etc. Are, are on the man, not on the woman. And that extends to making sure we look after our mothers, our sisters and all the women in our family. Women do not have to bring in money to cover these types of costs. Allah is saying that that is, for the, that is the duty of men. And in fact, Allah goes further to say that men are not allowed to tell their wives how to spend their money, whether that be an allowance or money earned from working. Women are free to spend it how they wish. And when it says Allah has made some of them to excel others, this is not saying or even suggesting that Allah has made men better than women. Unlike in, say, English, where usually a word has one meaning, in Arabic, a single word can have multiple meanings depending on how it is written and in what context it is written. If I said to somebody, pass me the pen or pass me the stapler in English, then you understand what I mean and you can pass me the correct item, as these things have only one meaning. But if I said pass me the stationery, then you would need further context to give me the right thing as stationery covers many items. So the word excel in this verse should be taken to mean an extra duty men have to bear. We have an extra duty above those which, are all, which we're already responsible for. So for example, providing emotional support for our wives or helping to look after our children, etc. Now when understood properly, this verse describes modern day life and relationships. Although men and women both go to work, both go out and work, men always feel like they need to make sure they bring in enough money to cover as many of the important costs as possible. As a man, I certainly feel that I should make sure that I'm able to pay my mortgage and bills or I'll be letting my family down and all my friends and family feel exactly the same. And as a loving husband, I also want to make sure my wife is happy and that I have an active involvement in all aspects of my child's life. And again, everybody I know feels exactly the same way. And finally, where it says, and the good women are obedient. This means obedient to Allah and not, as so many anti-Islamists suggest, obedient to men. So this verse for me is Allah directly telling men what our duties are and what we need to do to make sure we have a content and happy family. 
So are men superior to women? Do women have to unquestioningly follow the command of their husbands? No and no. The last objection people make, and when I say people, it's usually white men who think by pushing Western values on women, they're somehow saving them. They claim that in the Holy Quran, it states that men are allowed to beat their wives. This all comes down to how one word, darabah, is interpreted by people. As I mentioned earlier, Arabic words can have multiple meanings. And this word is a classic example of that. It can mean strike or hit, and it can also mean send away. Now, Islam makes rules to regulate the breakdown of a marriage, just like many countries, just like most countries do. And it gives four instructions to follow in trying to reconcile a marriage that is in trouble. It says, that if there is a complete breakdown of matrimonial relations, the first thing men should do is to separate their beds. And the reason is obvious. It's to protect women from being forced into having sexual relations with their husbands, against their will. Nowadays, we call that matrimonial rape. Next, talk to the wife and try and sort out the differences between each other without, at this stage, involving other people. Then the third instruction, now this is the, now this says the husband should daraba. And people have decided that it means strike or hit or beat. If we, it, now let's go with that interpretation for a second and then read the final instruction. The fourth instruction says, if none of the measures work, appoint outsiders to mediate between them. So the people who say daraba in this instance means beat are suggesting that the Holy Quran says first beat your wife and if that doesn't work then go and get counselling. How would counselling work if even after beating your wife things still haven't improved? If we, if we apply the other meaning of send away the instructions become separate your beds, talk to your wives and if these measures do not sort out the problem, send them away. The modern version of this is called a trial separation. And if none of these measures work, appoint outsiders to mediate between them. <coughs> so, in my opinion, and many others are now agreeing with this, is that Islam does not allow women to beat their wives, and this was a misinterpretation of this word. And the, uh, of, this was a misinterpretation of this verse and the word daraba. And of course, now that that is cleared up, people will inevitably say, well, why do women have to leave and not the men? Again, they make this statement because they do not understand how the family structure works in Islam. As I mentioned before, in Islam, men are given the responsibility to look after the whole family. And so often the parents, and grandparents and wives of brothers etc will all live in the house together so we're told that rather than 10 or 12 people all leave the house just the wife does for a short period of time this makes complete sense and is the logical thing to do people will probably say why should the way I have understood these verses be right well as I've always said let's look back and see how things actually were at the time of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, and after. During those days of Islam, women ran businesses. They went to the mosque, they were leaders, and were involved in state matters. Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, was taken to task by a woman when he tried to change the law and dowry, and he accepted her argument and changed the law back. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, when he advised his cousin, that she should not divorce her husband, he was told by her that unless it was an instruction from Allah, then she was within her right to do so, and he accepted that. Hazrat Aisha was a hugely respected teacher who was revered by men and women who came, from a, who came from faraway areas to get a better understanding of Islam from her. It's thought that 40% of the knowledge of Hadith came from her. 
how would she have given this knowledge if she had stayed at home and not been allowed out or was not allowed to talk to men? So if you look at the lives of women then and then look at these verses, there can be no other way to interpret them. <clears throat> Unless, of course, you want to argue that the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, did not follow the word of Allah. So Islam does not force a woman to wear a full veil. It does not say men are superior to women. It does not say that women have to unquestioningly obey their husbands. And it does not allow men to hit their wives. But have and do Muslim men do these things? Yes, of course they do. Look at any Muslim majority country <clears throat> and you can see that women are often treated as second class citizens. And this is an issue which needs to be urgently addressed. But let's have a look at women in the so-called free world, the civilized world where women have the freedom to do as they please and are looked after and protected by the rule of law. Here are some facts about violence against girls and young women in the UK. Sexual bullying and harassment are routine in schools and almost one in three 16 to 18 year old girls say they have experienced groping and other unwanted sexual touching at school in the UK from YouGov. One in three teenage girls in an intimate relationship ex have experienced sexual violence from a partner from NSPCC. Sending sexual images via phone or online is often coercive and linked to harassment, bullying or even violence. The threat comes from friends and girls are most adversely affected from the NSPCC. At least 750,000 children a year witness domestic violence according to the Department of Health. The Children's Commissioner identified that at least 16,500 children in England were at risk of child sexual exploitation in one year alone. Brutal gang rapes of women in India are not a scarce thing and were often overlooked. It took the brutal rape and murder of one young woman last year in India before some steps were taken to try to address the issue. Despite those steps, predatory gang rapes have still occurred. Coalition troops hailed the rights given to women as a key success when they took control away from the Taliban in Afghanistan in 2001 instilling a Western value of rights for women. But attacks on women were more frequent and more brutal in 2013 than they have ever been in Afghanistan. France passed a law which in part banned the wearing of a head covering, stopping women from making the choice about what they want to wear. And those women who flout this law have been regularly attacked in the streets of France by people. How is this liberating women? According to the World Health Organization, 15% of women in Japan reported physical and or sexual violence by an intimate partner in their lifetime. Recent global prevalence figures indicate that 35% of women worldwide have experienced either intimate partner violence or non-partner sexual violence in their lifetime. 35% of women worldwide. And what about in work? Surely it's more equal and women have the same opportunities as men. Well, of the top 1,000 companies in the USA, only 45 of them have a woman as their CEO. Only 4.5%. And according to the TUC, women working full-time still earn almost £5,000 a year less than men. And the pay gap in some jobs is three times bigger than that. The Chartered Management Institute said that men's bonuses in the UK were more than double those of women. And the Office of National Statistics looked at the people receiving the highest 10% of salaries in the UK. It found that 69% of them were men. And this is all after laws had to be passed so that women could receive equal pay to men. Without these laws, how bad would it be? And despite all of this bad news, 
A study by the Organisation for Economic Cooperation found last year that globally women work harder than men in their jobs. And I could go on and on and on. These are just a few of the hundreds of examples and statistics that, that I found whilst researching the numbers. So is the West a beacon for hope for women's rights? It doesn't seem like it is. But at least, unlike Muslim countries, it's attempting to head in the right path. I mentioned these things not in a tit-for-tat, you're no better kind of way. But this is to show that Islam, or any religion, is not at fault for the fact that women are treated as lesser than men. But it is men themselves, and only men, who are the catalyst for this, and scapegoating any religion or group of people will never solve the issues.